Good afternoon, or is it good evening, everyone? I feel like that was a slightly anticlimactic build-up. I was hoping for an exciting entrance, but we were just sort of hanging around. Um, <laughs> so, woo, yes! Thank you. So, uh, yeah, welcome everyone to the Wayward Festival 2022. If this is your first event, I hope you enjoy it. If this is one of many events you've been to, I hope you've got enough energy to, to still <laughs> enjoy it. Um, this festival is brought to you by the Word Centre for Creative Writing uh, with the generous support of Creative Scotland, Aberdeen City Council and the University of Aberdeen. I'm absolutely delighted to have Raymond Antrobus with, uh, with us today. Personally, I am a huge fan and I would have been here anyway, so it's like very, very cool that I get to sit next to him and ask him a few questions. So yes, I think we're going to have a very enjoyable hour. Um, uh, what's going to happen is shortly Raymond will perform some of his work for you. And then um, I think we'll have a bit of time for me to ask a few questions, have a bit of a chat. And then I'm sure there will be many of you who have questions afterwards. Um, and then I think there's after that, there'll be a little bit of time to do some book signing as well. Um, so, of course, the Blackwell stall is over there. You can get a couple of these, which you definitely will want to if you haven't already, especially after hearing us for the for the last hour. So Raymond Antrobus was born in London, Hackney, to an English mother and a Jamaican father. He is the author of Shapes and Disfigurement, To Sweet and Bitter, The Perseverance, and All the Names Given. He was one of the first recipients of the spoken, sorry, excuse me, <clears throat> One of the first recipients of the Spoken Word Education Emmy at Goldsmiths, and he has many an accolade, including the Ted Hughes Award, Lucille Clifton Legacy Award, PBS Winter Choice, uh, he was a Sunday Times Young Writer of the Year, and it, um, it does go on and on and on, as well as... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to sound rude about that. That's a good thing. And um, his work has also um, been used in the UK's GCSE syllabus. Um, not to mention, not just his um, written work, which is fantastic, but he's actually won a whole host of spoken word slams as well. So very excited to hear him read his own words. So I think I'm going to just let Raymond do that and stop talking. So once again, maybe we can applause and welcome Raymond before he starts. Hello. Hi. How's everyone? Good. It's my first time in Aberdeen. Um, so first impressions count. <laughs> so when I go back home, I can be like, they, I love Aberdeen and they love me. Um, yeah, no, it's an honor to be here. It's, it's a privilege to be here. I've just got on a very long flight um, all the way from Jersey. Literally, I don't think you could go further from one end of the country to the other. Um, it took a day, but I'm here, um, and I'm going to read some poems. So I think the first poem I'm going to read from first, or the first book I'll read from is this book called The Perseverance. Um, the Perseverance is, in the context of the book, the name of the pub that my dad used to drink in, but also etymology, uh, uh, the etymology or perseverance interests me. This is it. The verb persevere comes from the Latin root perseverus, which means continue steadfastly, persist. And that word comes from two others, per for very and severus for strict. So today the connotation of the word is to persist in a methodol methodological way despite obstacles or distractions. And um, that idea carries through, I think, the entirety of the book um, in the sense that in one way that um, I didn't learn to speak until I was uh, a lot older. My parents didn't know 
um, that I was deaf. I just thought I was slow. And then um, I got a lot of support, speech therapy, hearing therapy, hearing aids, radio aids, thrown into this whole world of um, uh, SEN, special educational needs, which helped bring me up. And now as a poet, that's become part of my practice with language, uh, a poetic, as it were. So this poem is called The Perseverance, the title poem. And I wrote it shortly after my dad passed away and all these memories just flooded me with times I'd spent outside this pub, The Perseverance. Um, so my dad was uh, an alcoholic as, as I was growing up. And I spent quite a lot of time in, in, in therapy since he passed away dealing, to deal with that. And um, one of the interesting things that the therapist that I was working with uh, kind of ex exhumed or explored was how much of my anxiety can be rooted in standing outside this pub, being taken there by a parent, and one version of that parent takes you there and they disappear for a while and they come back and another version of that parent appears. And in my case, my sober father was a very different drunk father. So the uh, kind of not knowing who I was going to get or how to handle it uh, is, is a root uh, of uh, some of my anxiety which I have professional help with. So this poem, The Perseverance, begins with a line from my dad's favorite singer, a man called Peter Tosh, one of the, one of the whalers, sang with Bob Marley. Um, and yeah, the poem starts there, The Perseverance. Love is the man overstanding. I wait outside the perseverance. Just popping in here a minute, I'd heard him say it many times before. Like all kids with a drinking father, watch him disappear into smoke and laughter. There's no such thing as too much laughter, my father says, drinking in the perseverance until everything disappears. I'm outside, counting minutes, waiting for the man, my father, to finish his shot and take me home before it gets dark. We've been here before. No such thing as too much laughter, unless you're my mother without my father, working weekends while the perseverance spits him out for a minute. He gives me 50p to make me disappear. 50p in my hand, I disappear like a coin in a parking meter before the time runs out. How many minutes will I lose listening to the laughter spilling from the perseverance where strangers ask, where is your father? I stare at the doors and say, my father is working. Strangers who don't disappear, but hug me for my perseverance. Dad said, this will be the last time before. While the TV spilled a canned laughter, us on the sofa in his council flat, knowing any minute the yams will boil, any minute I will eat again with my father, who cooks and serves laughter, good as any Jamaican who disappeared from the island I tasted before overstanding our heat and perseverance. I still hear popping in for a minute, see him disappear. We lose our fathers before we know it, and I am still outside the perseverance, listening for the laughter. Thank you. This is what my voice looks like on hands. And I've spent quite a bit of time between living in the UK and the US. And when I'm in the US, I try and pick up some American Sign Language which is different to British Sign Language, almost completely unrecognizably different. For example, 
ASL, American Sign Language, is, uh, has an alphabet, which is all on one hand. BSL is two hands. Scottish Sign Language, I know, is also different from British Sign Language. So it just gives you an example of the kind of complicated etymological terrain of a language on the hand, which is different to the language of the voice or the written language. So like any language, I try and learn just a few words to begin. And I find myself in New York and I wanted to learn a word and I read this story that had happened on the day I was there. It was a 300 word news article on a CNN website. And it told this story about a man called Daniel Harris. And when I read that story, I thought I need to write something to give this story volume. I don't think this is a kind of story that should just disappear like the headlines do. The word I learned that day was alive. So you can see it uh, live alive in British Sign Language. In American Sign Language, live alive. Two guns in the sky for Daniel Harris. When Daniel Harris steps out of his car, the police officer was waiting. Gun raised. I used the past tense, so this is irrelevant in Daniel's language, which is sign. Sign has no future or past tense. It is a present language. You are never more present than when a gun is pointed at you. What language says this if not sign? But the police officer saw hands waving in the air, fired, and Daniel dropped his hands, his chest bleeding out into the concrete meters from his home. And I'm in New York coffee house reading this news on my phone when a black policewoman walks in, two guns on my hips, on her hips, my friend next to me reading the comment section, black lives matter. Now what could we sign or say out loud when the last word I learned in American Sign Language was alive, alive. Both thumbs pointing at your lower abdominal, index fingers pointing up like two guns in the sky. Thank you. I'm going to read some uh, poems from the last book that was published, which is called All the Names Given. Um, and some of the, I suppose, the, one of the rooted ideas of this book is a few things. I got, I got married, so I was led to think about legacy, lineage, names, what we carry on. Um, and also, I'd spent so much time kind of leaving the UK, coming in between this space of, um, you know, customs, immigration, borders, all this kind of thing. And every time I came back to the UK and I gave him my passport, I would be asked about my name, my surname. I'd be asked, where does Antrobus come from? And it was always asked with the expectation that I would say anywhere else in the world except where it comes from. So I would say, it's an English name. 
I mean, I'd get this face. Is it? I never heard of it. Never. Uh, right. And I'd say, yeah, it's the name of a village in Cheshire. It has about 800 people there now. Um, but that's the name. Anyone with the name Antrobus, wherever they are in the world, can be traced, linked to this village in Cheshire, which means it's, it's a Norse name, which means I have a name that is so anciently English, it has become foreign to itself. So that is a gift to any artist because it kind of justifies my anxiety and my uncertainty. And it just gives me such a questionable, unquestionable path to follow. And so that idea of um, all the poems had this kind of second guessing idea to them because I just don't know, you know, poetry, poetry lines are in beats, they're in steps, they're in movements. So every step is questioned. And that is one of the kind of, uh, I don't know, conceits, poetics, ideas behind all that, something that joins all of the poems together. So I went back to Antrobus with my mother and I wrote a poem about my day in Antrobus village. So this poem is called Antrobus or Land of Angels. Wherever you are, you touch the bark of trees, different yet familiar. Shezlo Milosh. I can be fiendish, I can't be English, say ghosts. Some with shaved heads, some with cane rows, muttering themselves into notebooks. The barman's eyes in the antrobus arms become sharp gates when I claim to be English. My mother born here. My grandfather, the local preacher. Oh, well then, welcome, he says or land your angels. There are enigmas in my deafness. I stare at the crest of gold lines behind the bar. I scar the cross of Davidic's line behind the bar. Hear my ghosts say fiendish, English. The barman calls the whole village and my name does the rounds. My mother drives us to Antrobus Hall. Two German shepherds surround the car. I climb out, it's raining, the dogs jump, their paws scraping a new coat of earth on my chest. A farmer appears, asks if we had descended from Edmund Antrobus. Sir Edmund Antrobus, third baronet, slaver, beloved father, overseer, owner of plantations in Jamaica, British Guyana, and St. Kitts, I shake my head, avoid the farmer's eye. My mother and I tread the cemetery of St. Mark's Antrobus and see everyone buried here is of Antrobus. We look up and see hawks in the ash trees and sparrows in the wheat fields and the rain soaked stones of Antrobus and after we walk the slick mirrors of wet roads, the curves of Barber's Lane between trees, I take a photo of our shadows flung over the red berry bushes like black coats. So what I'm going to try and get up now is, a, uh, is an image that I hope uh, everyone can see. 
Um, yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how, how, can people see this image fairly well? So I thought while I was developing this manuscript that I was going to be writing primarily about Anshabos village and all of the different avenues, tangents, emotional history through that literal kind of homeland in, in, a, in a strange way. Um, but the pandemic happened and I was living in New Orleans in the south, in the south states. And um, so I kind of felt like I had to, to stop that and put that on hold. Um, and this is before lockdown happened, but it was coming. Every day we were just hearing on the radio, this thing is coming, it's going to be disastrous. And uh, uh, my wife, her name is Tabitha, we, and she's an art conservator as well. So we like going to museums and comparing our perspectives on art. Um, so we walk into this art gallery um, in New Orleans and there's this one huge room and uh, that I walked into and this painting was on the wall. It's actually about three times bigger than this um, if you see this painting in person. And I was kind of struck by it instantly, the color, the shade, what is in, what is in uh, focused here, what is in the periphery. You know, I'm, the way that I look at visual art often is I'm looking for the story. But Tabitha, my wife, she has a way of looking at art that is more about, I guess, color and material. So she looks at this and she says to me, you see how much shade is in this painting and the color of the skin of the people in the forefront. She just said, my God, I would have a nightmare conserving a painting like this because it's painted in 1860. So at this point, the kind of materials that, is, that are used to paint that, those kind of hues deteriorate very quickly. Lorna Goodison, uh, the former poet laureate of Jamaica, also a painter and a poet, uh, has an amazing poem about this where she talks about the ingredients that went into brown and black paint in the 19th, 18th century, 19th and 18th. So anyway, I was just looking at this and, and it just kind of struck me. I mean, I hadn't even yet got to the most significant detail that I looked at the plaque on the wall about this painting and it just said, painted by John Antrobos, 1860, oil on canvas. And immediately, again, I've been given this kind of mysterious gift and I am able to pursue this idea of Antrobos. I'm looking at an ancestor. Anyone I meet with that name is linked to that village is linked to me. So in my head, I start composing a poem. And this is the poem that came of that. Plantation paint. After Lorna Goodison and plantation burial in the historic New Orleans collection, 1860, Oil on Canvas by John Antrobus. Tabitha, the art conservator, squints at the color. Tells me the paint depicting the black of these men huddled for a burial would decay before the cypress trees surrounding them would decay. There are several kinds of black, she says, and the cypress trees surrounding them is all I see as we stand alive in this otherwise empty gallery. Why am I like this? What am I like? Who does it matter to? All details question my way of seeing. I worry what kind of black would mark me. I am not the paint made from vine twigs or burnt shells. I am not the lamp full of oil. Tabitha, tell me how you'd paint me. Tell me if I'm closer to the white painter with my name than I am to the black preacher, his hands wide to the sky, the mahogany rot of heaven. Sorry, 
but you know by now that I can't mention trees without every shade of my family appearing and disappearing. So this next poem is called A Rose, and I wrote it when I was thinking about, again, I was like just about to get married, and I was thinking about how, I guess, complicated and patriarchal and strange the institution of marriage is, and to be stepping into it wholeheartedly was, was complicated. Um, but even, or even, as poignant as that is just the fact that I have parents who just, their relationship made no sense to me. I remember being a child, looking at my parents and thinking, I don't know if they love each other. I can't, I can't see it. So going into a marriage, I needed to, I'm very good with visualization exercises, so I needed to f have some kind of vision instilled. And so I thought about a time when I did look at my parents and said, no, 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 they love each other. There it is. And this poem is the first memory that came to me that I wanted to hold on to before eternal commitment. And uh, it, the, the title is a pun on my mother's name, which is Rose. So the poem is called A Rose. My father called my mother Rose for short. Once I asked him how it ever worked out between them. The sex, he smirked. The sex was that good. I was 12 <laughs> and betrayed. But I'd seen him in my mother's garden that summer growing sunflowers. I'd seen him paint all the walls in her house that my mother chose to color. I'd seen him bend by my mother's bicycle, mend her tires, rock his head to a record she was playing, and ask him if he could borrow it. I'd seen the way he walked down the street, grinning with new music. Once I'd seen him stand behind my mother's market stool, when a woman held up a necklace my mother made and asked him how much it was. And he turned to my mother, said, Rose? And he said it like something in him grew towards the light. This is going to be an interesting poem to see signed. So I'm going to... I'm in Scotland, so... Allow me to evoke Seamus Heaney. Seamus Heaney um, has a speech that I watch every now and then. And every time I watch it, a new thing is evoked. And it's his Nobel Laureate speech, it's his acceptance speech. Every line is just brimming. It's a wondrous speech. And there was a point when I was watching it when I couldn't stop thinking about the line where he says, poetry is the beat of our tribe. Poetry is the beat of my tribe. And this idea is one of the most generous definitions of poetry I have ever heard. And so I, I, I lean on that because this idea of the beat, the language, the music, it kind of coincides with this idea that I was thinking about, about how poetry is music from the place you were born. So I wondered how I could honor that kind of uh, specificity. So I'm born in a place called Hatley, and now there's a lot of, uh, in London, and there's a lot of grime rappers that come out of that particular area. And you can hear it in the music, it's in the voice. <laughs> so I went back to the UK and went back to London and I bumped into a friend of mine that I went to school with. 
you know, outside a chicken shop. And we had this whole conversation in a way that the language we use implied a connection and a disconnection simultaneously. So this poem is called And That, and it's in my friend's voice. Um, let's see how it goes. And I'm just going to stand here and watch how this is going to be signed. <clears throat> Chicken wings and that. Boss man, salt in them and that. Don't assault, man. Give man a napkin. Big man, look steroid in that. Dark times, new street lights in that. And how's man? I'm getting by in that. Still boy, them harass. Not beefing, not tag man, still trap. Cycle man, pedaling and that. On road, new pavements, leveled and that. Crack knee change, still stay dwelling and that. We eat eight, East man, ain't got to adapt. Our kingdom, got no land to hand back. Man chat breeze, chat trade winds and that. Your out ends, got good job, legit and that. Lots off man them, stayed plotting and that. <laughs> Raw Ray, flower shorts, you a hipster in that. Man gone vegan. No chicken wings and that. <laughs> that was good. That was good. Thank you. So this poem is for a friend of mine. I dedicated it to another friend uh, called Tyrone, Tyrone Givens. My email inbox over the past few years has been unimaginable. Sometimes when I check it and the people that are in there, I, I, I'm not bragging. It's not humble. It's not, I'm not bragging, but it's just, it's just so, it's just kind of like, I never thought I would be in conversation with this person. So, um, I should just give a trigger warning that I'm about to talk about a friend's suicide. Um, one of my closest friends who I went to school with um, ended his life in a prison cell. And one of the reasons why this was such a shock to me is because, you know, the kind of person you go to school with who's like the popular person, the, the, the kid who everyone loves. And, um, you know, when you have those predictive um, end of year kind of textbook things where it's like this most person person most likely to become the prime minister person most likely to become a global famous superstar this was him he was most likely to be you know we all thought he was going to become this maverick superstar whatever whatever it was he did he had many talents and um, his life after school didn't end that way I went to a deaf school. I am educated in, I've gone through the British education system, partly mainstreamed and partly through the deaf British education system. And me and him, I think that was something that we kind of bonded over uh, and spoke about quite a bit. Um, but yeah, he ended up in this situation where he decided that he didn't want to live. And I got this email from this poet that probably no one here knows, actually. Uh, it's a quite an obscure poet. Um, his name is Simon Armitage. So Simon Armitage ends up in my inbox and he says, hi, I, like, as if we go back, I've never actually spoken to it. It was a very kind of like formal, like, hey, how are you doing? How would you like to write a poem for me? I was like, sure. And he said, okay, so here are a list of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's 50 articles. I'd like you to pick one and write a poem and we'll perform together in Manchester uh, to a room full of lawyers and human rights activists. Sound good? Absolutely. So I 
had a read th read through, but to be honest, I kind of just stopped at this one, which is Article 5, and it says, No one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. And I, uh, and I immediately was put in the mind of Tyrone and began writing this poem. I should also say that I wrote this poem during lockdown and um, James Baldwin, the writer, appears. And the reason he appears is because Baldwin became my, one of my lockdown readings. So I'm gonna publicly out myself and apologize to the literature community. I had pretended for many years I had read every James Baldwin novel. <laughs> I lied, I'm sorry. I did not, I read two. But I've now read every single Baldwin novel and I corrected that so I can now stand in my truth. And the thing that struck me when I finished, the, when I turned the last page on just above my head, it's the last novel he wrote in, in France, was uh, every novel had a suicide in it, every single one. And they all come at different points, um, some very early on, some at the end, some in the middle. But that was one of the consistencies. And so I was digesting all of that, I suppose, imagery and intensity of, of Baldwin. And he came to me and uh, appeared in this poem as well for Tyrone Givens. The paper said, putting him in jail without his hearing aids was like putting him in a hole in the ground. There were no hymns for deaf boys, but who can tell we're deaf without speaking to us? Tyrone's name was misspelled in the HMP Pentonville prison system. Once I was handcuffed, shoved into a police van. I didn't hear the officer say why. I was saved by my friend's mother who threw herself in the road and refused to let the van drive away. Who could have saved Tyrone? James Baldwin attempted suicide after each of his loves jumped from bridges or overdosed. He killed his characters, made them kill themselves. Rufus, Richard, black men who couldn't live like this. Tyrone, I won writing awards, bought new hearing aids and heard my name through the walls. I bought a signed Baldwin book. The man who sold it to me didn't know you, me, or Baldwin. I feel I rescued it. I feel failed. Tyrone, the last time I saw you alive, I dropped a pen on the staircase. Didn't hear it fall, but you saw and ran down to get it. Handed it to me before disappearing, said, you might need this. So I've mentioned a bit about therapy and um, kind of professional help, um, but I've sought to deal with some some of, some of my um, you know mental health, I suppose. Um, but I've done so many different kinds of therapy: talk therapy, uh, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I'm currently doing a mix of um, talk therapy and um, IFS, internal family systems. And what it's done is that it has helped me to just find a ground. I think my default position or mode or mood in the world is to kind of catastrophize. And I've just needed like 
grounding from that. During the pandemic, um, because my wife is American, I, uh, I, we couldn't see each other for nine months. So I was in an empty house for a while and I found myself spiraling and I needed to check into therapy. And obviously we couldn't see our therapist anymore. We had to go online and do that. And usually I compartmentalize my practice of self-help or therapy and writing. I do see the line between them. But this is one of those instances where the poem spilled between, I guess, the literary lines and the personal, emotional, lived line. And I had this session where I was just kind of talking and only in retrospect was I like, what the hell was I talking about? Why was I talking about things that happened 20 years ago that no one else has any memory of except me? Why have I kept this? But I had to get it out because it was only kind of swimming in my mind. And only when I plucked it out of the water could I say, what is this? And uh, poems work like that too. So this poem is... Uh, uh, an internal monologue and a vocal dialogue, I suppose, um, written very quickly after my first therapy session during lockdown. And it's called, I ran away from home to see how long it would take my mother to notice. <clears throat> Are you my drunk teacher who took our game of rounders way too seriously? Are you the boy who said I had the ugliest smile on the playground? Are you the girl that toe punted my balls and made me a piss sack of blood? The girlfriend who slept with women behind my back and said it wasn't cheating? I don't know what I'm saying. Would you be my friend? I spent hours in the house alone as a child. I left fingerprints on my sister's CD so the music kept skipping. I wanted her friends to be my friends, but I wasn't invited to her parties. Are you the party? Are you my dad lying on the sofa saying I'll soon be dead? When I pull what is existentialism off my mother's shelf, Simone de Beauvoir says, the movement of my transcendence appears futile. I don't know what that means, so I put it back. Fuck, who loves me? I'm testing everyone. I need space for all my old and new gooey needs and projections. I need constant blaring validation alarms. Give me award ceremonies. Please observe my wall of fame. Best second guessing overachiever. Best internal monologue while drying dishes. Best self promoter at the charity fundraiser. Best awkward silence in a moving vehicle. Best bad advice to a couple in crisis. Best non-smoker in the smoking area. <laughs> Most self-centered fear during the global pandemic. <laughs> Lifetime Achievement Award for most convincing head nod in a crowded pub. <laughs> most triggered person in an empty house. This is the last poem I'm gonna read and I'm just gonna do this thing of re like kind of centering myself by going over here. Is that okay? <clears throat> so I talk a lot, a lot about um, grounding, poetically, mentally, emotionally. And one of the ways that this plays into um, my practice of writing poetry is when I write a first draft of a poem, one of my ways to take it to the next draft is to write a question at the top. So I write really quickly 
and I, I just kind of let the dust settle on it. And then when I look back at it again, I look for the one question I think I'm trying to answer. And that gives me some direction, some focus, some grounding. And when I wrote this poem, the question I remember writing at the top of the page was, where did my language begin? And I wanted to answer that question, not in a philosophical way, but in a very grounded way. Where did it begin? And the thing that came to me was this memory of my dad reading this book to me called Happy Birthday Moon. Does anyone know this book? Okay, big up the one Happy Birthday Moon crew. I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, so the story is from the 70s. It's an American book. And it's about a bear who lives out in the woods. And one particular night stands on the highest hill overlooking the, the forest and the, and the village and the valleys and the, the, the river and green, right? And he looks up at the sky and he sees the full face of this moon just glaring back at him and he looks directly at the moon and says it's my birthday and the bear's voice echoes through the valley around the trees through the forests and he hears it again it's my birthday and the bear says wow it's the moon's birthday too so what unfolds is a conversation or a party or a celebration between the, boom, the, the, the bear and the moon. And throughout the story, there are little things that are repeated. And when I was read this story, my parents didn't know that I was deaf. But it was such a visceral experience, one that's going to just stayed with me for life, one that kind of makes sense to me now, like what I have grown up doing to be or become in some way. So my dad would lie me on his chest and have this book out in front of him, this big picture book. And sometimes he would do this thing. I'm interested if anyone relates to this because I think it's quite specific to my dad because he was a bit of a joker. But he would turn to like an empty page, a blank page, and he would put his finger on the, the blank page and he would start reading as if there was text there. And every time he got to the blank page, there's a diff he says something different. So what it was, what I realized is it was just him amusing himself. Because I, I, I have a son now, and I totally get having to read the same story <laughs> again and again and again. <sighs> It's beautiful. He's one years old and he's definitely going to be a reader. But there is a book he keeps asking me to read and it just makes me think of that. So I have started doing that. There is a page with no words and I'm just like, get to one bit where I am fr I'm free. I'm going to make up this bit. And he's just going to... Anyway. Um, that kind of, you know, that kind of moment of freedom. It's, in a way, my dad was saying, I can contribute to literature. Literature doesn't have to be this static thing, right? We can speak to it, with it, through it as well. I think that's what that taught me. Anyway, I want to invite all of you to that question of where did your language begin? Who can you thank for it? What have you done with it? What does it say about who you are now? Thank you so much for listening. This is an absolute joy to be heard. I can't wait to speak. Happy birthday, Moon. Dad reads aloud. I follow his finger across the page. Sometimes his finger moves past words, tracing white space. He makes the moon say something new every night to his deaf son who slurs his speech. Sometimes his finger moves past words, tracing white space. Tonight he gives the moon my name, but I can't say it. 
his deaf son who slurs his speech. Dad taps the page, says, try again. Tonight he gives the moon my name, but I can't say it. I say, Raynan Akabok. He laughs. Dad taps the page, says, try again. But I like making him laugh. I say my mistake again. I say, Raynan Akabok. He laughs, says, Raymond, there's something else. I like making him laugh. I say my mistake again. I say, Raynan Akabok. What else will help us? He says, Raymond, there's something else. I'd like to be the moon, the bear, even the rain. Raynan Akabok. What else will help us hear each other, really hear each other? I'd like to be the moon, the bear, even the rain. Dad makes the moon say something new every night and we hear each other, really hear each other. As dad reads aloud, I follow his finger across the page. Oh, Raymond Antrobus, folks, that was, oh, thank you so much. What a rich and just stunning um, sharing there. You know, I don't think it wasn't a performance. I really felt you were giving us something there. And so thank you for letting us hold that space for you. It was, um, it's actually just gone at half six. Helen, we did start a little bit late. So can we get maybe five, seven, ten minutes? Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> because I know I have some questions. Uh, I won't spend too long on that, though, because I do want to give you all the opportunity to, of course, get your questions to Raymond as well. There's just so much there. I think what I love about your work, Raymond, is that there is so much there. You know, there is the, the family history, the personal history that explodes out into a social history. Um, you know, everything is so personal, yet everything is so political. There's all these intersections, there's this, there's disappearing, there's transformations. Um, and it's just stunning to the, the way that you can convey all of that in such a concise way is really just, um, so I just want to say thank you for that. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to, to read and to hear. I want to talk to you a little bit about sound because that's obviously of a great personal significance to you <laughs> and um, in your work as well and your creative practice. I have heard you say that um, you aim to disrupt hearing people's assumptions around sound. So I was just wondering what are some of those assumptions that you're working to disrupt? That's a really good question. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, one, I mean, there, there are many, but I think the most biggest glaring sweeping mythology that is spewed is that everyone has a, like there's a binary between people that can hear and people that can't. And that's false. Everyone has a different relationship or a different ability with sound. Deafness isn't just this kind of thing where, you know, it's like absolute silence. And, you know, to, to make that, I don't know, a literary question, the, the, the Ukrainian American poet Ilya Kaminsky talks about how, uh, like, silence is an invention of the hearing it's kind of this default thing and what i'm trying to do is honor what my particular relationship and history with sound is it is not i cringe every time someone says deaf experience to me because it makes it feel like there is just you know, the deaf experience when there's a deaf experience. I went to uh, 
a deaf school with a range of um, people who had, you know, I had friends who refused speech, mostly friends who had um, hearing parents who didn't bother to learn to sign, who weren't deaf aware, and they were so angry about being rejected and being misunderstood by their hearing parents that they just opted out of the hearing world and all of its rules all together. And they I mean, only ever communicated through, through sign, through BSL. And then there were people that went the other way, the other end of the spectrum, people who were so ashamed of being deaf that they tried to hide it. And that was me, unfortunately. Uh, in, in, the, in the deaf community, you get sign names. So my sign name at school was this. And what it was, was it was because I always wore hats which covered my ears. So all the deaf people were like, oh, there's the boy who covers his ears. It's the boy who covers his head. And now my sign name is this. Ah, shine, ray of sunshine. So just through again, like I get to have this transformation of experience of my, I don't know, identity, as ungenerous as that word identity is, um, through that. And it's poetry, so much of it has been the writing and poetry and, and, and the sharing of it that has allowed me to kind of manifest a kind of recovery and a sense of ownership of what my own, again, literal and literary experience of sound is. When I say about the literary is because I also put myself in conversation with other poets who write about specifically disability non-abled poets, poets of the body, who also have to navigate the mythology that there's a binary of like someone who's not capable, who is disabled, and someone who is capable and abled. It's such a tedious, empty way of living. And unfortunately, the, the, the culture just gives it to us. It doesn't you know, uh, I've got a really good therapist at the moment, and he every week he asked me this question. He said, what, what was the story that you needed this week? And I always kind of bring in not maybe like a film that I'd watched or, uh, or a story that someone had told me, something that kind of I responded to. And sometimes he would say, oh, that doesn't sound like a story you needed this week then. I went to see the film Four, Four, the Marvel film. T-H-O-R, and it, and it just messed me up, man. I was so confused by it because it's like this real kind of toxic masculinity thing that's going on in, in it. But at the same time, he's like this really buffoonish kind of like where they try to undercut it, but it, they don't. It actually, it actually ends reinforcing. I, I, yeah, so I had this whole thing and my therapist was like, Ray, I just, I just think you shouldn't have seen the film. <laughs> I just think it's just not the story you needed. And so, like, you know, like, that's such an interesting idea, though. What are the stories that you need, and how can you follow them, and where can you find them? And you need different stories at different times as well, right? So even becoming a dad, there's, I, there's a host of, like, parenting, again, um, like, literary parents, people, writers who write about parenting, I'm kind of a, a, a mer submerged myself in that writing and, and, and reading. Um, I, just, I just feel so lucky that I get to share company in this way. This is what I mean, like, again, some of the rhetoric that we hear right now, you know, people are talking about the cost of living crisis, which is a very real and terrible thing. And the, 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 the argument is that that's constantly being made by newspapers and our government, you know, politicians, like government, is that um, all of this will be solved if we just stop studying art, if we stop studying English, because you're not going to make money 
And if you study technology or the sciences, you're going to have a fulfilled economic life. And there's nothing there about spirit, a spiritual, mental, emotional well-being. There's this idea, this kind of glorification of money, as if money solves or remedies a society which we know is sick, and it's not. So, I mean, I'm, again, trying not to get polemical about that, um, because who gets to access art, who gets to do that, um, is also a complicated question with different... I mean, I'm guessing that we both have immigrant parents, so we've also got that, like, you know, aspiration, like come and prove yourself and don't be a slacker. You, you want to be a poet. You want to be an artist. Are you kidding me? You think I, you think I did all of that for you to, you, you know, like that kind of thing. And you have to deal with that too. Uh, I didn't want to make assumptions. Assumption kind of well made, but that, I mean, that's actually just what I wanted to ask you next was about the accessibility of poetry because you spoke there about how personal it has been to you um, and how much that's helped you, how much it's given you uh, and how important the arts are to, to us as, uh, as human beings. Um, and obviously accessibility, there, there's a double meaning there, of course, you know, accessibility. And, but then there's also the, how, how, does, how do you access somebody's language if it doesn't make sense to you poetically or if you don't have the cultural capital or um could you maybe speak more to um yeah so that? i guess um one of my biggest privileges is i come from a home which did foster creative thinking and um i, I don't know alternative culture my parents kind of gave me the heads up they were like okay you're going to go through the education system and you're going to get lied to but at home, we will tell you the truth. Um, you know, so again, there's a kind of a weird kind of world there. But um, my, both my parents loved poetry. They weren't poets, but they loved it. Uh, my mom's favorite poet was William Blake and Adrian Mitchell. Um, she also spoke about uh, Adriani Rich and Jean Binterbreeze and all these poets, dub poets as well. My dad's favorite poet was Linton Quesi Johnson, Gil Scott Heron, uh, Miss Lou. And they just, they were just there. They were part of the fabric of my upbringing. So my mom put a, put a poster of William Blake's poem, London. I wandered through each chartered street on the wall that was always there. And then in the other wall was a, a poem by a Jamaican poet called uh, Evan Jones. And it was called The Song of the Banana Man. Praise God, in my big right hand, I would live and die a banana man. About a persona poem in the voice of a man who works in the, in the, in the, in the hills, cutting up um, yams and, 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 and bananas, green bananas. So it was just there. So by the time I got to an English classroom where they say, here is a Shakespearean sonnet, I'm going, oh, that's interesting that you're calling it Shakespearean, like strictly, because here's the sonnet that my mom showed me, and it's called Every Must Die by Claude McKay, um, which is a sonnet. And so, because I came to those lessons already with, like you say, culture capital, a background about why and how poetry isn't just relevant to me, but important, and a kind of love language, a family language, I wasn't ever intimidated by it. But then I did notice that uh, my peers were, because they didn't have that. So in becoming a poet, I do feel like my job is to kind of demystify it, is kind of to reclaim it. And it's been so bizarre in the past year, like since, like I have poems on, on the GCSE curriculum now, on some of the curriculums. And like, uh, yeah, there's, you know, there's the, the, some of the backlash to that has been really interesting to watch. The um, former education secretary of the UK, like, um, slagged me off in the national press, said like, who is this person coming around here thinking, why are we teaching them? You know, this kind of thing. I'm not, I wasn't offended by it. I was fascinated. I was like, wow, your mythology is that strong. 
because what do you actually know about poetry? I didn't understand that. Like, the argument was so binary. And, so, and then this whole conversation came up about Philip Larkin. And just to say off the bat, for all of Philip Larkin's problems in his personal life is absolute um, misogyny, deep racism, Nazism, classism, horrible man. Fuck, he could write, he could write a poem. <laughs> He, 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 like, I don't take it away from Larkin that he was a great poet. So they set up this whole thing where it was like, you, uh, Raymond Antrobas, um, thinks he can take the space of Larkin. But they, the, the, the binary was false because I then came out and said, I love Larkin. <laughs> I actually love him and I've defended him. Like, not him as a person, I've defended the work, the poetry. So, you know, then, then they did, no one knew what to do. Then no one spoke to me. <laughs> then they were like, oh, you, oh. <laughs> it's what I mean. Like, that's what the, that's the game that they're playing. They have to find what the binary is. You're on this side, you're on that side. And now we have a, an argument. The, the, the media, this is what their master's at. It's a game. Yeah. And so the thing is, once you start living, I suppose, a more holistic kind of, complicated truth the game falls apart because then it's like oh we oh that, that, oh you know yeah. I think, yeah as soon as you bring any form of nuance and compassion then you're right it's just like oh well actually there is a way that we can progress this forward that you can't do that in a rigid binary um thank that was such a generous answer thank you so much i'm really i know we're at quarter two but i'm really desperate to Two audience. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Helen. <laughs> I just we can't can't stop him. He's amazing. Um, so yeah, does anyone have a a, a question? Is a there's a roving mic going about? We'll get you. I'm going to sign books in as yeah. well, so that's fine. Yeah. Um, I was just want to say I, I, love, I really liked that bit where you were talking about um, you know well, that's not the story you needed. I thought that was brilliant. Um, just wanted to ask because you mentioned uh, memory exercises and seem to have like a very sort of you know vivid memory of this really early point in your childhood with the story. Um, what sort? What's your sort of method with that in sort of recalling those memories? Yeah, so like that's a kind of um, memorization poem uh, question. So um, it's, it's different. Um, I find that I just naturally have, um, I, I gravitate towards imagery, like that's just kind of just how I think. And so when I was at school and I started learning sign language, um, it was just so, you know, obviously it's this very visual, visual language, which you need your whole body to use. But all the signs that stayed with me were the signs that were the most, that made the most, I guess, um, sense or emotional sense. I remember being taught the word metaphor in sign. brilliant because once the English teacher asked me oh what's the metaphor you know that generic question the English teacher asked it's like oh yeah it's where you compare one thing to another thing it's brilliant so it just I think sharpened and in and heightened my metaphorical kind of thinking and in terms of how that helps with memorization is that I then think okay what image in this poem follows the next image what you know i don't always just go for the rhyme often the rhymes i use are hidden in the poems um, i'm a big fan of internal rhyme and slant rhyme rhyme words that almost work that don't um, that's in part because i believe i'm not a rapper and i will never be as a sophisticated rhymer as a great rapper like say Kendrick Lamar, who I think is one of the masters of internal quadruple rhyme. He can, he can have four rhyme schemes happening at once 
and it's just it's just mind blowing to me. And I think, okay, I, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to do this other thing where I'm able to apply what I know about uh, sign language and metaphor and image and transition of image, and allow that to be the, I don't know part of my kind of foundation. Um, so yeah, I mean, even so, when I first wrote the poems in this book, it was actually a play called "A Language We Both Know," and I'd written it with some friends of mine who were deaf actors and um, BSL speakers and performers. And even they, when they, when I watched them uh, interpret and perform some of the poems, they would say to me, "Okay, we need to have this image here. We need to change the image because of the the hand shape from here to here." It doesn't quite connect. So then some of the poems got moved around based on that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, all, all of this just is just, a, you know, what I'm trying to share is a kind of um, internal practice I have, which goes into how I remember, how I feel a poem. So when I write a new poem, I don't think I really know how it feels in my body or how it really sounds until I've written up, until I've said it in public at least 10 times. Like I have to find a cadence that has to sit right with me. So all of the poems in this book now, I feel very comfortable. I know where they are in the body. I know where they are in the mind. I know where they are in the heart. So I can, I, there's a kind of, I don't really need the, the page. I, I know them. Um, but what I found is, and I'll give you, this is just a, a tip, because I'm assuming you're a poet and a writer. But when you memorize poems, I found that people like, they'll clap and be like, oh, that's cool, very amusing. But then they won't buy your book. But if you actually stand on and they see you with the book, they start, they buy the book. I didn't sell any books before. <laughs> And that's what it just kind of got me. I was like, no one's buying any of my books because I know all of my work. But if I stand, if I see the book, like this is the power of product placement. <laughs> the, this is what I'm saying. The markets, the media, they know what they're doing. They're masters of this. So, uh, you know, you can steal a bit of that. So if you do want to buy a book um, or you want to test my memory, then uh, I can do that. That's not what you asked. I'm sorry. I turned that question into a plug. A brilliant response, I'm the same. I think we're, yeah. <laughs> I think we will have to uh, stop that there because there, there is another, there is another event. Um, is the signing happening down at the back? Uh, but first of all, I just want to thank the, the AV team, everyone at the Word Centre. Of course, Leslie, who's done an amazing job <laughs> signing. Thank you, Leslie. Um, and uh, this guy, Raymond Andrebus. <laughs> Thank you so much.